You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow a side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews. So let's get started. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Um, Today in the guest chair, we have Dominique Broadway. Dominique is an award-winning financial planner, personal finance coach, speaker, finance expert, and entrepreneur. She's the founder of Finances Demystified and the Social Money Tour. And shortly after launching Finances Demystified, she was named one of the top financial advisors in the United States for millennials at the age of 28. What I love about Dominique is that she has transformed the reputation of personal finances into a social experience by making it engaging, easy to understand, and even trendy. Her demystified financial advice has been highlighted on Yahoo, Black Enterprise, MarketWatch.com, Ebony, USA Today, and much more. On this episode, you'll learn how Dominique went from managing million-dollar investments for other people to branching out on her own as a personal finance coach and entrepreneur. So let's get right into it. Welcome to the show, Dominique. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor. Of course. Um, You guys might remember in the episode I did about the Signature CEO Conference, I saw Dominique speak and I was like, I just have to get her in the guest chair. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. No, it was great. It was great seeing you there. Like I said, it's it's an honor to, to be on your podcast. So thanks again for having me. Of course. So let's kick it off with, you know, we usually like to start from the beginning. So how... Do you mm-hmm. think your upbringing and your education and work experience supported your path to entrepreneurship? Um, I think I think my upgr- upbringing has definitely definitely I guess kind of put me where I am today. I mean, growing up, um, both of my parents were entrepreneurs at some point in their lives. Um, now, just one of them is, um, but seeing my parents, I think just being able to, as entrepreneurs, just being able to make their own schedules and, you know, being able to be available for me when I needed them and not rushing out in the morning, (laughs) Um, like like a lot of other families had to, um, was huge for me. And I really was able to see how much control they had over their time. Um, And I realized I always really wanted that for myself as well. So, yeah. Got it. So, you went to, I know you went to Bowie State for, and you studied mm-hmm. business administration. Um, what led you to study there? And then what was kind of your career path initially? Yeah, so I, I did go to Bowie State and I, I majored in uh, banking and finance, which I guess it's under the business administration school um, or school of business. Um, and I started out, I guess, kind of leading up to that point, going back, back to high school, really, um, I always realized I really wanted to be a, um, a financial planner, which sounds really, really corny, but I realized I wanted to be either a financial planner, a stockbroker, or something in that field. Um, and I remember in high school, just after seeing, you know, seeing my parents being entrepreneurs, but also realizing, you know, kind of researching and like, just saying to myself, like, I really want to be able to you know, extremely wealthy one day, not necessarily just to have money, just because I really valued being able to get what I want when I want. (laughs) And also coming back to that whole valuing my time. And so I kind of stopped and did some research and realized that the way that, you know, a lot of rich people were getting richer or the most people were obtaining wealth was either through the stock market or through real estate. And so I realized that that's really the field that I wanted to be in. Um, So I majored in in banking and finance at, um, at Bowie State. And because it was historically black college, we didn't have, you know, a lot of the major like brokerage firms coming and knocking down our doors to to bring us in for some reason. Um, The only people that were really coming to recruit were local banks. And not that there's anything wrong with that. I just realized after working at like Chevy Chase Bank, which is now Capital One for about three months, (laughs) that that was not for me. Um, So like I said, after the the major banks, I mean, the banks were coming and recruiting, I realized that no one was really coming to recruit in the field of like being a stockbroker or really in the investment field. So I had started, you know, researching stocks and I really realized it was a field that I wanted to be in. So I just, you know, went online and started looking for internship programs. And I found a program in um, 
I found a program in uh, New York City. And it was called University of Dreams at the time. Now it's actually called, I think it's just dreamcareers.com. And it was an amazing program which housed you for two and a half months at um, New York University. And then it also placed you in a um, in an internship program, which was, you know, what I really wanted. And I knew I wanted to be, like, like I said, in that investment space. So um, I got the opportunity to to interview. And it was interesting because you needed, I think you needed like a 3.5 GPA to get um, into one of these internship programs. And I did not, I will just say, I did not have a 3.5 GPA. I don't even think I had a 3.0 GPA. <laughs> um, but for some reason, I managed to kind of get into the, not necessarily get into the program, but get into this internship without them ever asking for my um my uh, what's it called transcripts, which is really, really funny. But anyway, um, I, my dream internship was to get in Morgan Stanley, and um, I got the internship at Morgan Stanley. And about three days before I was supposed to go to New York for this internship program, um, Morgan Stanley cut their entire internship program. So I was like completely devastated. Um, and then I default this other company called UBS Financial Services. We're like, oh, well, we'll take you know, we'll interview some of the people that are supposed to go to Morgan Stanley. We'll place some some of them with our company. I wasn't as excited about the internship with UBS Financial Services. Um, everybody else was, but I wasn't. And I had never heard of the company, probably really because they only really dealt with high net worth um, clients. So clients that had like literally 10, 20, $30 million is what they dealt with. But little did I know, I had one of the most like highly coveted internships um, in the whole financial services industry. So out of default, they took me in um, and let me intern with them. And uh, I stayed there for the summer, interned at UBS Financial Services. Awesome, awesome internship. Um, at the end, they they did offer me uh, a job and I uh, had to go back to school and finish my last um, semester. And then, you know, long story short, I um, ended up taking the full-time position once I graduated college and, and basically and started ended up ended up working there for a few years and I became a licensed financial advisor stockbroker working with clients like I said they had 10 20 30 million dollars sitting in their accounts which is absolutely insane um, and that was just kind of how I started my career into this space so how long were you with UBS and um, actually to, to rewind a little bit weren't you doing some hustles on uh -huh. campus I feel like I remember that <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've been, I've been, look, I've been hustling since I was probably about six years old. Um, I, yeah, I mean, my first, I had a couple of businesses, actually. My first business, I was selling bracelets and um, bracelets and like, uh, what is it called? Like uh, gimp bracelets and beaded bracelets. Um, went on a little bit. Actually, in middle school, I was selling candy and also in high school. Who didn't do that? Right. Um, and then by high school, I also um, met a guy named Michael Chambers, one of my good friends. Um, he had already started a company called Kids, Kids Interactive Data Systems, um, and I was kind of his, I guess, his uh, chief operating officer. Ran that with him for a couple of years, and actually, what we did um, in high school was taught kids how to use computer programs. Um, and this was before it was really taught in school. Um, so that was the business I had in high school, and then by college, um, I was dibbling, dabbling, doing a lot of different things. But one of the biggest things I fell into, which I completely fell in love with, was actually marketing. And um, I used to be what they called a brand ambassador um, for a lot of different brands. And I got really good at it. Uh, and I got put on like a big project with uh, Procter & Gamble and Safeway and Starbucks. And I really, really found my passion within Starbucks. So I actually ran some of the um, exponential marketing campaigns for Starbucks in the area. So I was managing sometimes a team of eight to, to 15 people um, to run these exponential marketing uh, programs in the, in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area from my dorm. And so I had like, they gave me like a computer and a, and a printer and a fax machine. I would literally go back to my dorm, do all the reports. And I was clocking hours from my dorm, you know, making over $25 an hour, which was really great now or even then. Um, and so, yeah, that was kind of, that was the hustle in, um, in college. So that was, <laughs> it was, it was fun because it was, you know, it kind of really tapped into my other passion, which was marketing to Got the it. point where I was like, oh, maybe I'll, uh, do like a double major in marketing. Um, then they told me how much longer I would stay in school. So I said, never mind. <laughs> but you know, my passion for marketing 
Okay, so for sure. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's it's cool to see that your hustle spirit has been here for a long time. So it wasn't just, you know, something that happened once you got out of college. So now you're at UBS. Oh, yeah. How long are you working mm-hmm. there um, before you start to build out your personal finance business? Um, so I was there for, I actually had been there for, I don't know, maybe four, five years. Um, and then after that, this is when like the market really tanked and they had a massive round of layoffs and I was actually laid off from UBS and I got a really, you know, nice severance package of about three months of, of pay. Um, and then from there went to another brokerage firm and kind of went to a couple of different brokerage firms. Um, so, and because I was a licensed, I ended up at my mentor's firm, which was the last firm I was at. Um, but because I was a licensed financial advisor, you can't just like start another, you know, something that's in the same field because I was licensed because of FINRA and SEC and Securities Exchange, Exchange Commissions and things of that nature. So um, when I took that, I guess that big leap, it was very, very, um, I did everything that people tell you not to do <laughs> as far as taking the leap. Um, I was at a point in my life where, you know, I thought it was like the quarter life crisis. I don't know what was going on with me, but, uh, I thought it was a quarter life crisis and, uh, I just really wasn't, um, I just wasn't happy. You know, you have that feeling where you're like, you have that dream job and you're in it, but it, it, you, it sucks. And I remember going to work every single day. I mean, I couldn't get to work on time to save my life, even though I lived literally probably seven minutes from my job, just cause I didn't feel like going. Um, and I went in one day and really just quit, literally just quit. And, um, with no plan in place, with no business in place, I hadn't built anything out. I was just going to work every day. And I had this feeling that I'm sure you probably felt this way before where you're sitting somewhere and you're like, I'm supposed to be doing something else. I'm supposed to be doing something bigger. What that else was, what that bigger was, I had no idea. <laughs> um, I just knew it wasn't it wasn't what I was doing, and so I literally went and uh, and just quit. Did you have no any money saved business. up? I I did, I did. I had about um, I had about probably a, close to a year's worth of my salary saved. I had always been a really really aggressive uh, saver. I kept my expenses low. You know, I was 22 when I bought my my condo. I literally move from my dorm to my condo. So I was always really, really good with money. And because I was always a hustler, I was never really short on money. You know, I always knew how to make money and make more money to get what I wanted. Um, you know, legally hustling, of course. <laughs> um, so <laughs> make sure that's in there. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I did have about a year's worth of my salary saved. And I th- think that what I guess what made it great was like, I kind of had, you know, people call, talk about that F you money. Like I had that money. It was like, I'm out of here. I don't need this anymore. You know? Um, and I had that, I was financially confident, you know, I guess to say that I don't, I don't need to do this. I'm out. I'm unhappy. Um, and so the, the, I guess the issue or the thing that was interesting there is that, you know, like other, a lot of other people, and when I tell my clients all, all the time, when you're preparing to take that leap financially, you know, make sure your business is producing enough income, you know, that it can prove to you for at least three months that it, that it, that, um, you know, it can produce the income that you need to survive plus more, plus I say another 40 on top of that. Um, I did not do that at all. Um, but I did have money saved. Um, and I figured out, I knew I would figure something out at some point. And because I was an African-American woman that was licensed, um, a licensed stockbroker, firms were scrambling. They, as soon as I left, like, it's like a, a whistle goes off and people were calling. So I figured I could like get something at some point if I needed to, but I, I just didn't know what I wanted to do. So. Got it. And so what happened next? Yeah. Um, so I guess after that, it was about, uh, <laughs> it took me maybe about, let me see, June, July, August, September, about four months to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I was literally in, um, in Miami, actually, a few weeks after that. And I always tell this story. We had like, this trip was already planned to go to Miami with my friends. And we're all kind of, you know, standing around like, oh, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And it got to me. And I was like that friend that's like, oh, I'm in between things. And it hit me like, oh my God gosh, Dominique, you have no job. And of course my family is like, what are you doing? You have a mortgage, you have responsibilities. And I'm like, I'm trying to find myself, you know, like the worst thing that any parents want to 
here. Um, but anyway, I thought I wanted to become get into you know real estate. So I actually went down to Baltimore and like put contracts down on a couple pro- properties that were really inexpensive properties, like five, six thousand dollar properties. Um, and all the contracts fell through. And then I thought I wanted to um, open a cupcake shop. So I started kind of planning it out. I was like, oh, I'm going to open this cupcake shop. And then I realized I like to eat the cupcakes, not make cupcakes. I had no real recipe for cupcakes other than like <laughs> dunk time. So, so that was done. Um, and then I was literally driving in my car one day and I was kind of thinking about it more and more like, what do I want to do? And I, I knew I still really liked personal finance. I just thought that, um, well, I, I thought I hated personal finance. And then the more I thought about it, I'm like, I like personal finance. I like finances. I just need to do it my own way. And I was just kind of, you know, after being in the financial services industry, a lot of it, not everyone, but a lot of the people in the industry and the industry in general is very, very corrupt. I feel like they're selling people a lot of products that they don't need, um, you know, and I just didn't want to be a part of that because I felt like they were just selling people stuff and not helping people. Um, and then I'm, I'm in my car and... Um, I'm really praying about it. And then this commercial comes on. It's like, oh, for sisters only next week. And so I um, I was like, man, maybe I'll get a booth at for sisters only and launch a financial planning company. Like saying this to myself. So I call for sisters only and like, hey, I want to get a booth. How much it costs? They're like $1,000. And I was like, oof, man, okay. It's a lot of money, but I got it. I'll pay. I, I believe in this, you know? So I, I remember filling out the form, my credit card number, faxing it back. So I guess people were still faxing back back then faxing it back over um and then they processed the payment so fast and i was like locked in right so i called my friend i was like hey i'm starting this company next week i'm helping people with their finances can you like make me like a one-page landing site and business cards my favorite color is turquoise it's always been turquoise <laughs> i was like i want my color my colors to be turquoise i mean even my condo now is painted turquoise and chocolate it's so funny when my friends come over, they're like wow you've been in this turquoise thing for a while i'm like yeah i have <laughs> So, and that was pretty much really how it started. So I paid a thousand dollars for the booth. I had about 95 people that signed up to get on my email list. That's how my email list started. And I ended up making almost a third of them clients, um, which was awesome. And then that's pretty much how, how everything literally got going. I love that story. And guys, I wish you could see the picture of, you know, Dominique showed us this picture at the conference and it was like, what was it like a clip art looking black lady? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's so funny. It's what is it? Oh my gosh, it's like this. It's like a lady. She's holding like me. She's like short. It's like a character. It's it's horrible. Anyway, <laughs> but the point, the point the point is yeah, you did it and you got started. So so from there, you said you had a third of clients at that point. Like walk us through the creation of Dominique the brand. Now, are you? Did you structure and and start an LLC? Did you buy domain names at this point? Yeah, so I had already I had already bought the the DominiqueBroadway.com and I decided at the well, I bought DominiqueBroadway.com, but I had decided I wanted to name the company Finances Demystified. So that's actually the official name official name of my company is Finances Demystified. So I had bought the Finances Demystified.com as well as the DominiqueBroadway.com, um, and then I registered as LLC Finances Demystified LLC, um, and from there I. I actually ended up going broke after that, which was interesting. Um, so that's when that's when the real financial life started. Um, so I, I started the company, as you know, in, in a week or so. But I had these clients coming in. I was still licensed to, uh, you know, a license, life insurance salesman, things of that nature. So I was still helping people with a lot of different things. But when it came down to the actual financial planning part, I wasn't sure what I wanted to sell um, or how much I wanted to price myself because I wanted to make sure it was something that everyone could afford, right? Versus the the uh, the, plan, the brokerage firms I came from are charging people $1,500, $2,000, $3,000 for financial plans. I knew that the people I was helping could not afford that, right? So for a while, it was just kind of like, oh, what do you need help with? I'll help you with that. What do you need help with? Okay, that's that price is fine. And I was just really treating it as a passion project and not a business. And so, um, you know, about a year later, I look up and I'm completely broke. Um, and I'm just like, oh, my gosh, what happened? And it was weird because I've always been financially on my game. Um, and it, it was like I kind of turned a blind eye to my own personal finances because I was, you know, so engulfed with this with this business. And so I literally 
really had to like go and to my parents and say, look, I messed myself up financially. And it's funny, all my clients are calling me. They're saving their first 10,000, 20,000. They're buying their first home, their first investment property. And I'm like, what happened? I've completely ignored my own personal finances. And as entrepreneurs, and I talk to entrepreneurs all the time, you know, we tend to do that. We get so into this other thing that we completely ignore our own lives. Um, and I had done that and I was treating it, like I said, more like a like a passion project and not a business. And I had to take a step back and uh, um, completely restructure every, putting better systems in place, um, better checks and balances in place, setting revenue goals, um, creating better pricing. And by this time, you know, not saying that the first year should be your trial and error year. I wouldn't recommend that. But for me, it was trial and error. I was figuring every single thing out on my own. Um I was figuring out how to create what I feel like was a really different type of business versus what my parents had because, you know, it was almost um, not necessarily an internet based business, but it, it was more, you know, I guess kind of tech involved um, where I'm, you know, bringing most of my clients on to work remotely um, and there needed to be an onboarding, onboarding process, a payment system. So I was figuring all that stuff out on my own, but also after working with clients for a year, year and a half at that point, uh, I was also able to figure out what the best prices were. So now I was able to solidify my prices and finally put things in place. So yeah, I really needed to kind of snap out of it and say, okay, this is what you need to do to make this thing really work. Cause the demand is there. It's you that just doesn't have the processes in place. Right. Um, so that was kind of what, what was next after that. Um, and then I think another big part, um, one of my friends, I know I, I was, I really wanted to brand this thing completely as finances demystified. And um, a lot of people were telling me like, no, you would do much better branding it as Dominique Broadway. And I'm like a really, I'm not necessarily a shy person. And I, I always say I'm, I'm more of an ambivert, which is like an introverted extrovert. You know, I grew up kind of only child. So I'm kind of, I'm pretty to myself. I don't need a lot of attention. I'm pretty chill. Right. So, and everyone's, I'm like, I don't want this whole thing focused on me. This is not, <laughs> this is not what it's about. You know, I'm trying to just help people. And everyone's saying like, no, if you focus the brand more around you, it'll take off. It'll be better. And I said, okay, all right, I'll, I'll try it out. And I, and I did that. And I kind of focused the brand more about me and more about my journey and, and about how I'm helping people um and, and about kind of me and my lifestyle and how I kind of eat live and breathe everything that I'm that I'm speaking and things definitely just took off um and so, so it was hard for me because I, I that's just not me I'm, I'm much more behind the scenes type of person than like a front of the scenes person um but yeah that was really you know kind of the process of you know <laughs> kind of I guess taking that launch and really turning it into the turning the brand into what it is now okay I could totally relate to I think a lot of us um just want to start a business right and make money and then like we begrudgingly are like okay I have to put my face out there I have to you yeah. know people yeah. need to know who they can it's trust hard. yeah it it, it, yeah. it really is it's an adjustment for many of us because I consider myself an introverted extrovert as well um, so uh -huh. when you did realize that you had to start in integrating like your personal brand into this, what were some of the first steps you took to actually do that? Like, was that when you started social media or just rebranding your site with your face and how did you go about it? Yeah, I would, I would say it was probably just telling my story more on social media, um, and using, I mean, it sounds so weird using, I guess my face on on maybe a social media post or re relating this back to my own personal personal life or just putting myself out there more um, because I was much I was, I was fine with just like putting a quote out and saying oh, oh save money every two weeks or whatever right just something simple um, and not necessarily not necessarily associating myself at all versus saying you know quote saying save every money in two weeks and I'm saying hey you know. I was able to save my first house by 22 by, you know, setting aside $500 every two weeks or something of that nature where people are like, oh, oh, they can relate it back to me in my real life. Because people say all the time, like, Dominique, you don't just preach this stuff. You actually live this stuff. Like, you are literally like, I'm like, I'm not a big couponer, but I will coupon online, but I'm not going to be out in the grocery store swinging around a bunch of coupons. Just I don't got time to cut no coupons. <laughs> but, you know, I do like, hey, you're going to you're going to see me at Marshall's before you see me at Saks Fifth Avenue. That's just how I live. And people are like, oh, my gosh, where'd you get this outfit from? I'm like, whole outfit from Target. And they're like, what? 
but that's just how I've always been. Right. So I think that, you know, I realized like people said, like you really do eat, live and breathe the stuff that you talk about. And so it made it much more relatable. Um, so that was really how I feel like I took that, that first step. It was a gradual process for me because honestly, if, if it wasn't for this business, I would probably not really be on social media because I'm not really a big, I'm not big. I'm not a private. I mean, I'm not a public person at all. I'm, I'm actually a very private person. Um, so it's still a hassle now, even now, like most of my social media stuff, it's scheduled. It's scheduled a month in advance, you know, um, you know, unless something random pops up, but, but you know, it's, it's not like my second in nature just to be posting every uh every 10 minutes of the day yeah. so it was definitely a hard transition but it definitely helped people to uh to relate with me a lot more okay and then now you are i mean if you follow dominique on social media every week every other every couple of days traveling speaking <laughs> at a different place how are you continuing? yeah how are you continuing to grow your brand and get these speaking opportunities like talk to us about that intentional process Girl, I don't know it. You know, honestly, <laughs> I have to say, I don't even know if it's necessarily an intentional process. I think um, the biggest question I get probably at least once a day in my Instagram DM or Twitter DM or Facebook, whatever, is girl, who does your PR? And I'm like, I don't have a PR person. <laughs> I've never had a PR person. Um, because people are like, you're everywhere. And I think, you know, I think I've been really, really blessed that the work that I've done has, um, has gone, you know, has, has not gone unnoticed. And I think that the passion that I have for personal finance, which is probably one of the most unsexiest fields, um, has, has been highlighted. And so, because of that, a lot of the a lot of opportunities come my way, and so a lot of times people ask me like, "Oh, well, can you recommend a PR person?" Yeah, there's tons of great PR people, but for me, you know, what I've learned, and I'm sure you you've probably seen this as well, is that if you go out every day and put your best foot forward, and do you know work hard and just really put a lot of effort into your business, your brand, into helping people, and into your mission, it will go people will notice you and people will want you on their TV show. They'll want you on their podcast. They'll want you on their, on their speaking tour. Um, and that's literally how it's been. So the cool thing is that I would say 99% of the thing, the speaking opportunities, the on air opportunities or media opportunities that I've had this year, um, have been, um, things that have come to me. I have never pitched to, to um, anyone before. Actually, I did one pitching last, when I got on Fox 45 last um, January. Um, and the only reason I emailed this person because I knew her, we went to high school together and I was, I mean, college together. And I was like, hey, you think I could be on, on, your, on your channel? She's like, sure. She's a producer. First time I've ever pitched anyone. Um, and so I think for a lot of people, people are like, wait, what, you've never pitched anybody? And it's like, no. Um, but I think you know, I, I really enjoy the speaking part. Um, it's probably one of my favorite parts of the business. Um, and I think the speaking is really helping me to grow my brand in general because I'm partnering with larger brands because of that. Um, I'm able to reach hundreds, if not thousands of people, you know, at a, at a speaking engagement. And, you know, it's, it's that in-person thing. They see you, they like you, you're real. It's like, oh my gosh, she's a real person. You know, I would love to work with her. I would love to follow her, whatever it may be. Um, so I think that if you put the good work behind you, everything else will follow. Because I haven't, I mean, this year, I'm probably going to be a lot more intentional with that stuff. Because I'm like, if all this stuff is coming without me asking, what would happen? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. What would happen if you pitched? Okay. So we... Yeah, right? Let's go back really quick to your turning point because after you launched your your business you said you went broke mm -hmm. and I think you know you talked about not charging what you're worth so how did you learn mm -hmm. to start charging based on you know to stop being like a passion project and make it a business um I think when I realized that I was really that this was something that was helping people um one that and then two also that um I knew that I could I needed to help myself like you can't help 
anybody else if you're empty, you know? And that's kind of one of the biggest things my grandparents always taught me. And so I was helping everybody else, but I was, I was tapped out. You know, I couldn't even help myself. And I knew that the service that I was providing was a valuable service. The work showed for itself. The testimonials that people were giving to me showed. And so I realized that I needed to charge what I was worth, not just so I could keep my bills paid, one, um, but also so that, you know, I could keep myself up and running and keep this business around so that I could help more people. Um, and so that that was probably when I realized that, you know, I wasn't charging what I was worth. Um, you know, and, and that, that it had to happen. So I think everyone has, has that, that turning point. I wish I had figured that out earlier. I think for, I don't know why, but for sometimes for women, it takes them longer to figure that out versus I know men who start businesses every day one, they're like, you know, this, this is my pricing and versus <laughs> women are like, what can I help you with? What do you need? Like, I don't know why we do that. I guess yeah. cause we're nurturers, but thank God I figured that out earlier versus later. Okay. Um, but yeah. And then how, how and when did you start to reap the profit from your business? And what were the first things you invested back into the business? Um, I, well, I would say immediately I started reaping technically profit because I, um, I would say, I mean, I, I didn't have a lot of, because, because I started out as a service-based business, I didn't have a lot of money to, to put out to, to, to get it going um, because I was selling just my knowledge that I'd already you know, learned. Um, so I pretty much was technically profitable from day one, right? Okay. Um, but I would say immediately the biggest thing was, you know, I, I bothered a lot, you know, getting my website, my, my whole original website, logo, everything visual, which was really all that mattered when I first started was all bartered. Um, it, a friend of mine did it. And so, you know, I needed a website, he needed financial help. Boom, it worked, right? Um, and so I bartered for quite a while, but even once, you know, the dollars really started rolling back in, I started investing into, you know, various, um, you know, online programs. So that may be, you know, upgrading, getting a better uh, client relationship management system or, um, you know, getting, um, you know, better just just systems in general to to keep the the, the business flowing and automating more things. Um, I in the beginning I didn't do a lot of investing into necessarily into marketing because with word of mouth and with social media I was getting more business that I could handle honestly. Um, so I didn't really start honestly putting dollars back into I would say actual marketing via ads until this probably the past. Yeah, maybe this year, 2016 and the late part of 2015, because the business was just, I was just so busy that I couldn't necessarily take up for, you know, <laughs> handle the take on anybody else. Um, and outside of that, it would be, you know, I started, you know, hiring people that would help. Sometimes they would help just seasonally. Um, I had people that would help virtually. Virt virtually. Um, and so, and then every couple of years getting a new website and things of that nature. So that was kind of, you know, where I would put my dollars back into. So, okay. you know, a lot of the things I think of the space, yeah, just kind of help with the, the visual aids, but that was pretty much where, where my money kind of went back into. Okay. And then, you know, you always had a backup plan. You could technically, mm -hmm. you were highly coveted, go back into brokerage. So how much were you earning before you said, I'm never going to look for a full-time job again? Did you match your salary that first year out? Um, the first, no, 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 mm -mm, nope, first year out, no. I would say it's probably two, two and a half years out, I probably matched my salary. Um, and now I'm definitely exceeding it. And I, you know, a funny thing, I never thought about going back, really. Um, I would have moment, I think every entrepreneur has a moment where you're like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Um, actually probably maybe once a month, you're just like, oh my goodness, it'd be so much easier just to go to a job. Right. <laughs> um, but then again, then you see like the checks coming in. It's like, oh, I made that in a day. Okay. That, that would have been two weeks. You know what I mean? Um, so I guess going back to, going back to work was never a real option for me. Like I never updated my resume. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, after I left, it's it's still outdated. I think one time I actually updated it because my company was bidding on a um, 
a project to do some financial literacy courses for organization. And then me and one other person under my company was going to be an instructor and they wanted our individual, um, our, our individual, uh, I guess kind of resumes in addition to the, the the company's information. But other than that, like going back to work has not been an option. Um, even though it's not an option, I think it would I always tell people it would have to be an amazing opportunity where I'm like going to run financial literacy for the whole United States or going to like run financial literacy for all of like Visa or something. But other than that, I, I just, I couldn't see it. I really value my time too much. Yes. Love it. So I want to transition into kind of a finance 101 for entrepreneurs. And I saw you talk through some of this at the conference again. So number one, what are the biggest mistakes you see entrepreneurs making as far as money management? Um, I would say not managing their money at all. Um, and, and I think in a kind of a sub of that is, one, um, one just completely commingling their business and personal finances. Um, I was working with a client recently and saw probably one of the worst comminglings I've ever seen <laughs> of business and personal finances, where they've taken you know debt under their business and debt under personal, and it's just all completely just completely commingled. Where I'm just like, wow, this separation is going to take some time. Um, but I think commingling your business and personal finances is one of the first things you want to stop doing. You know, if you're going to take the time and pay the money to get an LLC, then you need to uh, definitely make sure that your business and personal finances are separated. Um, another big mistake is not setting financial goals at all. Um, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, just like I did, I just woke up and started a company and didn't say, okay, Dominique, you need to make, you know, $5,000 a month or 10,000 or 20,000, whatever it may be, you need to set those goals. And if you're not setting those goals and doing those, um, setting those kind of like benchmarks, you don't even know if you're, if you're, you're, you know, succeeding or failing or whatever it may be. Um, but also I think not pricing themselves correctly. Um, like, like, like that's another mistake that I made, you know, not taking the time to, to research, to see what other people are charging, where are you at on that, on that scale? Um, and how much, of you know we talked about this at the you know at the at the conference like how much of each product do you set do you need to sell every month or some variation of it to reach that larger goal and then checking in on a weekly basis um or sometimes daily basis to make sure that you meet your reach your daily oh gosh tongue twisted reach your daily financial goal or your weekly financial goal so that you can reach your monthly financial goal um and i think that you know entrepreneurs you know, people, I think a lot of times people frown upon sales people, but entrepreneurs, if you're not selling, you're failing. It's point blank. So if you're not out here making these sales, then you're not going to have a business. So you need to treat your business and, and you know, kind of start tracking those sales is that's really, really important. It's not, it's not a passion project. It is a business. Amen to that. And I think, you know, because I'm one of those people that's at that stage where I really do need to separate business and personal even more than I already am. And formalizing that process is the first step. But then there's also when you're first getting started, especially when you're side hustling, it's like you have to be more aware of what a business expense even is. Like, obviously, they're the big bucket things. Like, I paid for my yeah. website. I paid for this. But there are even smaller things that I think entrepreneurs are not always cognizant of because you are commingling, like you said. So do you have any tips yeah, and advice yeah. for how not to do that? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is making sure that... Obviously, something very simple, such as just setting up a business checking account, um, obviously making sure you have a business checking account, then obviously keeping it completely separate from your business personal account. And one of the biggest things that I did was, you know, in the beginning, sometimes it is really hard, but once your business starts bringing in money, set a time set either, you know, once a month or every couple of weeks, or even if it's a few times a month where you're transferring money directly from your business account to your personal account and then paying all of your personal bills out of your personal account. So for me personally, like I get paid once a month right now for my business, but essentially, you know, even if there's a bill, let's say if you need to pay your rent or whatever, don't pay it out of your personal. I mean, don't, don't pay it out of your business account, write yourself a check out of your business account and pop it into your personal account. So at least that way is completely separate and you can write, you know, Hey, this is an honor withdrawal or something of that 
teach you to keep things separate. Um, but make sure you're using, even if it's like a free accounting tool, you know, maybe like Mint or QuickBooks or, or Wave apps or something like that income um, so that you can see how much you're bringing in and make sure that you're also making enough money to cover your personal expenses. Got it. Because um, a lot of times the reason why the funds are co-mingled is because people aren't making enough money to cover their personal expenses. So they're paying them out of their business account. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So you recommend writing that check once you're making money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or even if, you know, it's, it's one personal bill that just needs to be covered, just write a check out of it, get that money out of your, you know, out of your business account instead of paying for that personal bill out of it. So you can start to create that separation. Mm -hmm. And then as far as uh, structuring your income action plan, uh, what are some tips for doing that? In, in addition to breaking it down into products times price per product? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, sit down and I always say kind of work backwards, right? So let's say if your goal is, I don't know, $5,000 a month, you know, um, figuring out how much of each, you know, widget in, in, uh, in, I don't know, each, each widget you need to sell and each widget that could be, you know, a one-on-one -on -one coaching session, or it could be a, uh, uh, a finance box, or it could be, um, you know, a book or, you know, a, a podcast um, sponsorship, whatever it is, but how many do you need to sell every single month? So if you write that, that big goal at the top of the page, then start writing down like, okay, I need to sell five of these um, podcast sponsorship spots at 250. And I need to sell 10 of these, um, I don't know, uh, financial planning packages at 500, whatever it is. So you figure out how much you need to sell every single month. Then once you have that income action plan, you can just throughout the month say, okay, great. I sold two of these sponsorship packages or I sold two of these financial plans. You know, you're kind of checking off your progress throughout the month instead of looking up and saying, oh crap, it's December 31st. I sold one of widget. I only sold one widget. Where did I go wrong? Right. So making sure you're checking in on a daily basis to make sure that your income action plan is actually working. So figure out what that larger number is and then create a strategy working backwards to reach that that financial goal. Got it. And I think that accountability piece is huge, too. Like since I saw you speak, I've been checking my accounts every day, like you said, because, you know, once you mm -hmm. let it. Oh, good. But good. once you let it go to like two days, three days, next thing you know, you're checking back in, you're catching up on expenses, and it's just, you know, be super, super present. I love that advice that you gave. Yeah. So, yeah, because that could be more, more daunting when you wait too long. <laughs> right. There are all these expenses. And speaking of, of daunting, um, taxes, that's the final area <laughs> of, of, you know, Finance 101 I want to touch on because. One, what are some of the biggest mistakes you see entrepreneurs making there and how can we fix it? Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes is kind of, I don't know why entrepreneurs feel like they don't have to pay taxes. I don't know what that's <laughs> about. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, people just really act like we could just like, if you start a business, you get to like skip out on the tax bill. Definitely not the case. Um, so I think, you know, one, just acknowledging the fact that you do have to pay taxes and setting aside um, money for that. So if, you know, I always tell people, you know, if you can save at least 20, really 20 to 30% of what you're bringing in for taxes, that's great. Um, and I always say, if you have a target amount that you want to make, that you want to bring home every month, you know, add on an additional 40% to that, because that's going to cover your taxes plus, you know, your health insurance and all those other things that you're not, you're no longer going to have provided by your employer. Um, so make sure you're setting out, setting aside a certain amount to save every single month towards your taxes. And if you can, try to pay your taxes quarterly. Um, that will just kind of really help to reduce that, that tax bill um, at the end of the year. Because I see a lot of entrepreneurs who get a tax bill, and they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know it was going to be this high. Now, obviously, if your tax bill is high, it's a good thing because that means that you made a lot of money. Um, but essentially, you want to make sure that you're setting the money aside, but also that you're keeping track of all your expenses. I've also seen a lot of entrepreneurs, especially in the first few years of business, pay too much in taxes because they're not keeping track of all their expenses. And they're not writing off all the different things that can be written off, such as, you know, buying a computer or um, you know, pens or pencils or business cards, websites, um, you know, graphic design services, all those different things um, that, that may, may be a part of the startup funds of your business um, or even, you know, 
little things like traveling to a conference or paying your contractors, things of that nature can all be, um, can all help to reduce the amount of income that you're bringing in, which means you would pay less taxes. So you want to make sure that, that you're putting money aside for your taxes, you know, seeing if it's an option for you to pay quarterly, if so, doing so. If not, making sure that you're saving money uh, every single month, but also that you're keeping track of all your expenses because more, a lot of those expenses are actually going to help you um, be able to pay less taxes every year. Okay. And speaking of that, I forgot about this part, but can you talk a little bit about the EIN versus the DUNS number? Um, because I don't think a lot of people realize it's two separate things or even that why a DUNS is important. Yeah, so there's the EIN, which is your employer identification number, which is kind of like our, you know, our social security number, which most people have for their business. So basically your company's name will have its own uh, EIN associated with it. But another number that you're supposed to have is your Dunn's number, which is your Dunn and Bradstreet number. Um, and basically what that is, it's 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 like kind of like another social security number, but it's the number that you can use to help establish uh, credit for your business itself um, so that you get to the point where you're not having to use your own, um, your own, uh, you know, social security number to help uh, support the business line. Um, so now I know a lot of larger businesses will use their DUNS number to open a trade line. You know, a lot of companies will use that if they're getting products mass produced or something of that nature and using it to, let's say, you know, get the product made now and pay net 30 or pay 30 days later. Um, but you want to make sure that you have that number uh, and that you're providing both of these numbers to your bank, to your, uh, your banks, but also to, you know, your credit card companies or whoever else so that you're establishing um, that credit um, under the DUNS number as well. And so typically when a business will, when a, a company is pulling your business credit, they're going to pull that DUNS number and it has a between zero and a hundred. Obviously it's kind of like, you know, getting A, B's and C's in school. It's a similar grade range. So the higher your score, obviously A, B, C, D. So you want to make sure that you're having obviously your A or B for your business credit. So you want to make sure that you go and get your DUNS number. You just go to, I think this is done in Bradstreet.com or Google it. Um, you don't have to pay. It's completely free, but make sure you're getting that number as well. Um, and if you, um, yeah, make sure you get that number as well and sharing it with with um, any creditors for your business so they're so that they're reporting that positive, hopefully positive uh, payment history to, to that number. Thank you so much. All right, guys, that was Finances 101. If you need more personal up close <laughs> advice from Dominique, uh, you can contact her directly and we're going to get into where to contact her and how at the end of this episode. But before then, we are going to jump into the lightning round and you know the, the deal here. You answer the first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Yes. All righty. Number one, what's an online resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? Mm, online resource. I would say, um, this is weird. This is probably a really broad answer, but Google in general, <laughs> I have to say just Google. Like, I think I just, I'm, I'm a very resourceful person and just be the power of just looking something up when I need it. Um, it's, it's just powerful. I feel like there's an answer for everything. I think that, you know, people always say Google this, Google that, and people just don't, don't use Google. So I would say just Google in general has been extremely resourceful for me. I don't know if I can run a business without it. Okay. Number two, <laughs> what's the best book or podcast episode or live event that you've consumed this year? Hmm. I would say the best live event that I've been to is, um, the, uh, oh gosh, what's it called? Project Entrepreneur, um, uh, what's it called? The Project Entrepreneur like Incubator. Um, early, early, I think of March or April of this year. Um, I was accepted into that pro program. It was a three day program. It was absolutely amazing. Um, I probably took more out of that three day program than I've taken out of a lot of other events. So if you have the opportunity to apply for the Project Entrepreneur um, Incubator, it's absolutely amazing. Awesome. Number three, what is a daily practice you use to start your day off on the right note and increase your productivity throughout the day? Um, it will be two things. One is I try to work out every single morning. When I don't, I can definitely notice a difference. When I do, my 
days are always a thousand percent better, even if it's just running for 30 minutes or doing some squats or something. Um, the other thing is doing brain daily brain dumps. I have a little bit of ADD and my brain is all over the place. So I try to take a blank paper every day or I use my uh, finances, uh, what's called my financial organizer that I created and actually dump about all the ideas, you know, out of my brain onto paper. And it really helps me to figure out things that I want to accomplish on a daily basis. Cool. Now, who would you say is your favorite black woman entrepreneur? Um, it's actually one of my good friends. She's probably little known, but uh, her name is Jewel Burks. And she's a founder of a company called Part Pick. Um, she's raised millions and millions of dollars in funding, Forbes 30 under 30. She's all around phenomenal woman. Build. I basically watch her build a company from scratch to a multi-million dollar company in probably three years. Um, and so she is one of my favorite uh, entrepreneurs who I feel like does, she doesn't get tons of credit, but um, the technology that she's built is, is like none other. So she's one of my favorite entrepreneurs. Awesome. And yeah, I know Jewel. She's awesome. She, um, in my, yes. before this was a podcast, yeah. it was just a blog series and she was one of my first interviews. So definitely have to have her on the podcast too. And then, yes. Yeah. She's one of my good friends. I, I, I admire her so much. She's amazing. <laughs> awesome. And what's your parting advice for fellow women entrepreneurs who want to be in your shoes, but are scared of losing that steady paycheck? You know, it's, it's really my, my kind of signature quote that I live by. It's don't fear failure, fear regret. Um, and I think that if you're worried about losing a steady paycheck, as we all know, no paychecks in life are steady. Nothing in, in life is guaranteed. So I would much rather you, um, you know, go after your dreams versus waking up at 95 and being full of regret. So don't fear failure, fear regret and go after what you want in life. What an awesome note to end on. I uh, I love that. Quotable, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, before we wrap, <laughs> what's next for Dominique? And we'll, we'll start with that. Um, oh, it's a lot. It's a lot of things that are a lot of things that are next. A lot of things I can't even talk about, which means it's exciting and big things. Ooh. But outside of that, I'm working on an awesome tour uh, with Tanya of My Fab Finance. Um, that's launching in April of next year. It's called the Millennial Wealth Experience. So we're hitting three cities. Um, it's going to be an amazing, amazing uh, tour. We're going to be kind of doing higher level things. So not just budgeting and saving. We're going higher level, talking about investing in real estate and art and investing in startups and starting startups and just really taking your wealth building to the next level. So that's one of the big things I have uh, coming up and, you know, just, that's, you know, something I'm really excited about, but hopefully I'll do tons more speaking engagements next year and launching a lot more, lot more products and just continuing to make personal finance fun. It's the whole goal. Love it. And I love the fact that you're always just open to collaboration and doing cool partnerships. Yes. Yes. That's, that's what it's about. You know, we have, we all have to work together. And so as they say, it's two heads are better than one. So right. and I, I've been able to be amazing entrepreneurs like yourself and you know and it's a partner and you know it's, it's always great to to work with others so yeah well thank you again for being on the show in the guest chair what's the best way for thank listeners you. to connect with you after this episode um so my website is just dominiquebroadway.com on instagram is probably where i spend most of my time it's dominique broadway and we also have a um a free uh facebook group called millennial uh, wealth builders, which is another just an online um, online uh, Facebook group. Um, also on Twitter, not there as much, but it's just Miss Finance Coach, MS Finance Coach. But those are all the places you can track me down. Cool. So there you have it, guys. Hey guys, thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you want to hear more from me, head on over to sidehustlepro.co forward slash side hustle corner to get my weekly side hustle diaries chronicles about my own journey from passion project to profitable business. And if you want to find me online, I'm at side hustle pro on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't forget to join the side hustle pro Facebook community. Go to side hustle forward slash mastermind. And as always, if you love the show, do me a favor and subscribe rate and review on iTunes. Thanks, guys. Talk to you next week.